So, uh, let's start. Let's talk about new technology. And, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to uh, give you sort of a framework of the things we're going to be working in. Then I'm going to talk about the course, what I expect of you and what you need to do to pass this course. So, first thing is this guy. Do you know who this is? This guy actually runs the most, the, one of the biggest phone companies or phone manufacturer. Very old company, founded in 1855, well established. They actually owned the market a few years ago. This guy runs Nokia, Stephen Elop. So uh, now you all know Nokia. This is probably the most successful phone manufacturing company in the world. You know, how, how many have Nokia phones in here? At least few people, okay. Um, in fact, they were so powerful uh, at one time that they had one third of the world's mobile market. You know, this is a company founded in 1855 to do printing. They went into a lot of things including toilet paper and, and a lot. So it's a very old company. But in the 1990s, they, they, they started to go into telecommunication business and uh, became very successful in this. They had one third of the market, the world market. I mean, imagine if you had 1%. They had one third. They owned the, they were the biggest guys. And when the smartphones came, they had two thirds of the market. I mean, how, I mean, this is being success successful. This is one of the most successful phone companies in the world. But then something happened. If we look at the stock, so this is, you know, 2007, and then they're dying. They are getting killed. But they probably made all the right decisions. Good management style, they made, I mean, these guys are not stupid. They probably made all the right decisions. And this is what companies do. They make the right decision and fail. Now, this is an important lesson. You make the right decision, you still fail. Well, what kind of decision do you need to make? If the good ones don't work, well, do you know what happened? Why did this happen? Why, why didn't Nokia kill the business, you know, own it? What happened? Anything new that came out in 2007? IPhone. Ah, iPhone. We call it the iPhone effect. You know, it's not just that they created a device. They just blew the industry away, completely changed the industry. They broke the model. And we will talk about the iPhone effect. And there's something that happened. There was a shift in powers. So if you look at the companies that uh, went into the new kind of smartphones, these are Apple on top, the green, then you have Google with Android, not that su successful, but Android is still the biggest smartphone in the world. And then you have Nokia doing, going down and Blackberry going down. So what happened? What happened was that you have these phones, closed model phones, and then Apple and those guys, they came and they, at one point in time, they managed to take the Mac OS, the operating system for the Mac, cram it into this thing here. Now, how could they do this with this device? Well, the thing is that these devices, they get better every year. They double in performance every two years. So in 10 years, you have like, um, what is it, 30-fold more performance or whatever it is. The power of the devices is getting huge. And in 10 years from now, we will have something that is faster than the biggest supercomputers. And in fact, if you take this device, you compare it to the fastest supercomputer, a huge data center of the 80s, 80-something, 80 I haven't looked, looked at it, and this one will be powerful. If this, was a, if this existed 
in 1980 something, it would be the world's fastest computer. So this is why you could suddenly cram a whole operating system and then touch, something happened. So here's how the shift is in this. You have Symbian controlling, Symbian is Nokia system. They have 66% at this time. RIM and then Windows Mobile. Then a few years later, you have uh, RIM is still hanging in there, but they have been declining. Android, that's a new one. And iOS, those didn't exist four years earlier. And they own the market. They didn't exist. So something happened. And this is how technology revolution happened. Sometimes they come as a surprise. Symbian is, you know, going. In fact, they realized this last year, and in a memo this guy Elop did in early 2011, he sent a memo to everybody and said, you know, we are on a burning platform. Now, what did he mean? Well, the Nokia operating system, Symbian, was an old one. It was built in the 90s. And what was the situation in the 90s? Bandwidth was very limited. Memory capacities were very limited. Focus was on voice, not data. So the operating system was built for an era that was gone. Now we're doing a totally different thing. We have devices with lots of memory, lots of stuff, and real operating system. And real operating system meaning that you can have software running on it. You know, installing an application on a Nokia smartphone a few years ago was limited to uh, Java and me or something, whatever it was called. And today, there's actually a whole industry, billions of apps that people can, can uh, download on this. It's cold in here. So what did they do? I mean, your company is going down the toilet and you'd have nothing. Well, actually, they had operating system, but they decided to sign a deal with this guy. Uh, would you trust this guy? This is Steve Ballmer, the um, CEO of Microsoft. So, strange bedfellows, you know. And somebody made the comment, you know, two turkeys can't make an eagle. I mean, Microsoft is also in a, in, in a, in a problem because they had an outdated operating system, too. But this is not new. In fact, we can go way, way back to find similar stories of businesses making all the right decisions and then bloops, fail. So let's take a look at one. Um, 1878, Western Union. Now, think about 1878. What would be the main communication form if you needed to call somebody? What would you use? It would not be a smartphone, obviously. What would be the method of communication? Telegraph. telegraph. And these were in the telegraph business. Remember the telegram. You've seen it in the movies. You send a telegram, and then somebody will use Morse code to did 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 did, and then it will be transferred over the wire. Somebody will write it down and give it to the person. You've seen it in the movies. Now, after the Civil War in the U.S., they got a lot of cables. And they had 7,500 offices, 12,000 employees, just doing, and mostly doing telegraphs. Very successful. But then what happened? Anybody guessing? Remember in the trailer there was this guy? This guy? He came along. Now, this guy was actually trying to improve the telegraph, because the telegraph was very limited. You could send only one message. Did it, did it dash and dots, only one. But he wanted to improve it, send cords of dots and dashes, and then improve the speed. You could send multiple messages over the same thing. Now, in doing so, in trying to send cords, uh, it came out like sound. So uh, it was very close to sound, and the people that were sponsoring this guy, they actually wanted him to pursue sound rather than pursue um, rather than to pursue telegraph. Now, there's a lesson here. 
also, you know, most inventors, they don't take leaps. Now, he was trying to improve the telegraph because that was the prevailing technology at the time. Going into a new model is very difficult. So, but he did. And he created this telephone. And it was not, he was not the only one. Actually, there were lots of people inventing the telephone at the same time. But he got the patent. And uh, now he tried to get people to... Uh, by this idea to found a company with him, but it was very difficult. People were really skeptic of this. They didn't believe in this telephone. His contemporaries. I mean, the telegraph was the way everybody would send the message. So he went. Actually, you know, he couldn't succeed. So he got dismayed and went to Western Union and said to them, "You, you know, I have this invention here, the telephone. Uh, uh, I want to sell it to you. You can have it for one hundred thousand dollars." which is probably like a couple of millions today. And Western Union did all the right things. They took this and they went over it. The engineers went over it and they looked at this and they came to a conclusion. Good management. This is the internal memo they sent. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a mean of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Thank you very much. Bad mistake. Well, they did all the right thing. They looked at the technology. It was complex. It was it was complicated, but yet it was so crude and didn't do things very well. Performance was really low. It was difficult to work with it. It's not like the telephone we have today. Um, and they looked at their own business and said, where do we get the revenues? We get them from telegraphs. And how many people are asking for telephones? None. Why didn't they ask for telephones? Because there were no telephones. So Bell went into business himself, created the Bell Company, which became the biggest company in the world. A couple of years later, after Bell approached Western Union, Western Union decided, hey, everybody's talking about telephones. Two years later, everybody's talking about telephones. We need to get into the telephone business. So Bell sued them, and there was a mess of trials. So um, Bell became the biggest company probably in the world, got, got chopped up by the U.S. government in, in the 80s, and uh, Western Union had to go into another business. They, they are also very, still today, they are also a huge company, but they went into another business. Uh, but this is not limited to communications or technology as we think about technologies in, in forms of phones and things like this. Think about this. You know, do you know what this is? You, your parents might have this in their ho home. Yes, your parents might have it. Oh, grandpa's. My parents have this in their, in their home. You know, at some time, this was the way parents would, you know, prepare for the education of the kids. They would have this encyclopedia ready for the kids. Unfortunately, they probably didn't read it. Um, 1868, I think it was, a um, few printers in Scotland, you know, printers being a profession, you know, persons, not things like we know them today. They actually went into, they got this idea, let's make a compilation of all the knowledge in the world, and they printed this book one volume to begin with. And then over the years, uh, this became extended. And Britannica was the encyclopedia. So in 1980, uh, this was a huge company uh, with a huge sales force and making 650 million a year. Quality stuff. And yet they got killed. Poof, one day. Because of this. A plastic, piece of plastic killed them. Now, this came out. This is the Microsoft Encyclopedia. Now, the people at the Britannica, you know, not stupid people, they looked at the CD-ROM and compared it. It turned out that the Encyclopedia, the book, had much, much greater number of articles, much more. And they had much better, much, much, the quality was much better. So there was no 
comparison here. You know, this product was clearly low performance. The other one was the good stuff. But then sales do went down. Because students, people in school, people doing research, they wanted to search the encyclopedia. They found this to be much more convenient. And it came free with a computer anyway. So they would just put the CD in, do some search, find something good enough. They didn't need the books. So the Britannica went for sale. It was sold. It came back in, on the web, but still competing with Wikipedia. Uh, let's take a couple of more, or one more example. You know, this was, this was doomed to fail. You know, Blockbuster, uh, in 85, they started. They had 5,200 stores in the beginning of January 2010. 5,000 stores, and this is 2010. And things happen fast sometimes. Before the year was out, they were bankrupt. You know, people are not going to the video store anymore. <coughs> this was obvious that it was, this was going to happen. And yet, they did not do anything about it. One of the things that killed them was this. You know, the problem with getting a DVD from a video store is not that you have to go and get it. You have to go again to return it. And if you don't, you get a fine. And Black Blockbuster was making a lot of money of charging people late fees. But Netflix did not. The Netflix model worked brilliantly in the US where you have post box at your house. You get, you sign up, subscription, subscription, so they have guaranteed revenue. $10 or something every month you will pay. And then you can have unlimited number of, or maybe it was like 10 or something, I don't, I don't know. But <laughs> you, could, you could fill out a form, put it in your post box, and then a day later or two days later you would get the CD, the DVD with the, the film, the movie that you wanted to see. And you could have at most, and you didn't need to return it the day after. You could have it as long as you want, but you can only have five DVDs at any time. So if you wanted the sixth one, you have to return some of the other ones. Late fees gone. So there's a thing here, there's, there's a lesson here. And if you look at it, technology is one of the, one of the uh, major factors of change. So it's surprising that we don't know that much about technology and how technology changes. And there are actually very interesting laws, theories, and frameworks that can actually tell you how things will go. Um, for example, here are some things uh, that I have uh, observed that will happen. We know that are happening. Couldn't shouldn't be surprised. <coughs> we have. We have two billion people today connected to the internet. In a very short time, we will have two billion more. So we will have, in a very short time, and this is because this grows exponentially. It took many, many years to get the first billion. It took very short time to get the second billion, and it will take even shorter time to get the next two billion. It will take less time to get the next two billion people on the internet than it took to get the first billion and the second billion. So, and it's not that people are connecting to the internet using computers. They will be using something else. They will be using this type of computer, mobile phones, or something. TV stations, as we know them, dead. I actually have a technology death list. TV stations. I mean, you turn on the TV, and there's a guy somewhere out there who decided that you should watch this tonight. Do you like that? Do you do that? Probably. And, and who decided that you should watch one episode of a series every week? You really like this, you really like this series or this show, and you want to watch another episode of this show. Now, so what people do is they download it if they can. 
because they want to control their own programming. Now, this is not that simple because we will see later, and I have a, one lecture on this, how we will see, you know, when I turn on my TV station, it's actually going to do programming for me. But not by some guy somewhere sitting in an office trying to decide for everybody. You know, let's make a, you think, think about this. I mean, you're a programming director for a TV station, and you need to come up with a program that will fit anybody, everybody. Everybody will like it. Everybody's going to watch the same thing. This is not the future. In the future, some software, not person, will create my schedule based on what I do, what I like. So when I turn on the TV, I will see shows that I like. My wife turns on the TV, she will see something else. TV station, as we know them, gone. This is obvious, DVDs, CDs. This is just a distribution format. And if you can do it, you know, on a wire, that's the way. Newspapers will go out of business. Actually, they did last year, both the major newspapers in Iceland. But somebody funded them again. Do you believe this? And all over the world, newspapers are struggling. Um, mobile phones will dominate internet traffic. Traffic will be dominated by something else than computers. This is happening probably next year. Social networks, we don't know where this is going. This is a study, you know, will be very interesting. Real-time news is handled by, remember the Arab Spring that was last year? You know, all the YouTube videos, the clips, the tweets, the pictures coming from people's mobile phones. And then you turn on CNN, Sky News, what do they show you? They show videos from YouTube. Because they don't have the coverage. They can't do it. It's in real time. But they can do something else. They can do in-depth analysis of it, which the, the amateur couldn't do. But real-time news handled by organizations. E-books will take over. I talked about this for many years, but uh, suddenly now people believe me. You know, having this with all your books instead of having, having uh, you know, a stack of something. And it takes me, this is a Kindle here, and if I wanted to, if I get a, if, I, if somebody tells me about a book or I find a book that, you know, I really like, so I'm going to buy it, you know, uh, 30 seconds later, I would, be start, I would be reading this book and I haven't logged on to Amazon yet. I log in, find the book, press one click buy, downloads, 30 seconds later, I'm reading. You, you can't compete with this. I mean, I, I would... And it's probably going to cost me the same thing as going to the store, but the convenience is something to look at. And then having all your books here, I mean, textbooks for lectures, having them here instead of taking them to school is, is a compelling thing. Credit cards, and I'll put some random things here, credit cards. Now, why do you need credit cards? It's stupid. It's plastic stuff. It's going to be here in the phone. Don't lose your phone, then you lose everything. Cars will be self driven do you believe this? I mean, isn't it much safer to have some software running the car than a person? Person, you know, when we drive, you know, from the same routine every day, our consciousness or, or part of the brain that doesn't think very much actually drives the car. So we can be doing a lot of other stuff. We can talk and on the phone, we can, we can talk to people next to us, we can think about things. All of a sudden we're home. We didn't think about driving because it's so natural to us. So the part of the brain that doesn't think actually does the driving. But then if you're in a strange city that you've never been to, you can't do this. You have to focus. So the part of the brain that actually does the thinking will, will uh, do the driving. Now, having the part that doesn't think Driving is very dangerous, and that's why we have a lot of accidents. So the only solution is that, and imagine if we if we have self-driving cars that communicate, you don't need traffic lights. You come to an intersection, the car 
would just talk to the other cars and say, you know, and they would coordinate so they can pass. You know, imagine you come down Miklabrot and Kringlemerbrot is on crossing and you're on 60 or something kilometers per hour and you just drive through and all the other cars just, I mean, because all you need is one second to go through because the cars will talk and they will decide who will pass and what speed. Imagine that. Would you like to be in that car? Give it a few years though, you know, let's see how it goes. Google Maps was actually filmed, street view of Google Maps, but actually filmed with a self-driving car. But that's not legal to have a car driving off in traffic. So they had to have this person that sits there, does nothing, probably reading or something, while the car just drives. And th this car actually had an accident, and that made the news. You know, the Google car had an accident. Uh, I was some stupid guy that ran into the car. And printing objects, think about this. You, there's actually printers today where you can print objects. There's actually printers where, that can print cars. So if you need a prototype of a car, you can actually print. Printing objects is something that is going to be really interesting, and it's coming to our homes. So all of these things are coming, and we will be talking about many of these things. <coughs> but if we are evaluating technology trends, it's really difficult to see how things are going. It's much easier to see them if you look back. For example, if you, if you, I mean, this is the same car, but obviously it has improved over the years. There's a progression here. There's some performance that is being improved all the time. But this is basically the same car. You know, four wheels, steering wheel, a motor in it. But it gets gradually improved over time. I mean, you can only see it by looking back. Then you have, every now and then, you have technologies that get disrupted. And then something strange will happen to these things. Uh, if we look at the situation that we are living in now, we have moved from very few years, we have moved from the analog world, which was the 20th century, the analog world, where we had films, books, paper money, CDs, printed newspapers, um, analog phone, watches. So in a very short time, and this is why it's so difficult to predict those things, uh, because this happens very fast. So what happens in, you know, almost like a decade, and this is what Steve Jobs talked about, he, Bill Gates also, they talked about the digital decade. And there's a huge change that is happening, and this is why it's really exciting to be following technology today, uh, because all of these devices became digital, and that changed everything. And it makes a fundamental shift in how we consume content, and we're going to be focusing uh, a lot on, on, on these things in the course. And one, one statistic that I've talked about previously Every 48 hours, every 48 hours, uh, as much content is created as since the dawn of man until 2004. Now imagine, everything that was created from the beginning of time until 2004, if you could put that on a stack, all the content, everything, we are now creating this, generating this, the same amount of content in 48 hours. And this is getting worse. Uh, when your phone will measure temperature and send the temperature to the weather bureau or something, think about the data. I mean, we can record anything. I'm recording this. I will put this somewhere. Somebody will copy it, you know, uh, streaming content and so on. So we have moved from this analog world to this digital world. Uh, and this is where a lot of the innovation will happen in the in the next few decades. Uh, so if your business hasn't been disrupted by the internet, it will uh, in some way or another, and most of them are. Now there's a, another thing that is driving this, and we will be talking about this, and that is the, the Moore's Law, how things are 
make getting faster and faster. And now, if you think about this in a gener generic terms, everything works in an exponential way. Everything happens. That's why it's so difficult to predict, because we ha th have this linear view, but everything is exponential. And this means that in only 10 years, you can have a computer like this, the iMac. Remember the iMac when it came out? 30 gigabytes. I mean, the iPhone has more. <coughs> it's much faster, and the screen resolution is the same. So in 10 years, you, we have moved from having a desktop computer to a computer that you have in your pocket all the time. And the funny thing about mobile phone is they are very personal and most people, 70% or something, they sleep with it on their nightstand. It's, it's on the nightstand when they're sleeping. So it's with them all the time. Um, and the average person, I think, checks it 18 times a day, you know, always checking what happened in the last minute. So this is the digital lifestyle that we are going to be looking into. Now, one of the things that happened in, in the few, last few years was the rise of the cloud. Uh, so everything is connecting to this cloud. Uh, this is one of the things that we will be looking at in, in the course. Um, and we also have all these different devices, and they are all changing. Uh, well, some of them are new. The TV is changing. Now, what, what we need to think about now when we are building solution, businesses are building solution, is what are people doing when they are using these devices? And people behave in different way. So if you have your digital profile somewhere there, uh, you can access it from whichever device you want. Now, if you are using a TV, you probably want to sit back and consume. But 76% of people that do this actually have another device while they're watching TV. Six, do you do this? You're watching TV? Are you with your phone, tablets? 76% of people do this. Uh, if you have a laptop, you're more focused, you're working. You know, sitting with a laptop, you have this feeling of work. This is why it's very difficult to have TV sent to laptops because people want to be in a different position when they are using uh, TV. More work. Browsing. Now the iPad, I have one here. The iPad, when this came, you know, a lot of the technology people said, you know, who, nobody's going to use this. This is stupid. I mean, it's gonna, not going to come. But then people said, you know, I need to get this. I don't know why, but I have to get this. And they did. And, but then they discovered that they had this browsing um, requirements or browsing, you know, they, they, they needed to browse while sitting in the living room on their couch. They wanted to browse. And this is perfect. You're not working. If you need to do some work, you probably grab your laptop. But people are having multiple devices. Uh, these e-readers, that's also for reading content, consuming content. Uh, some of the readers are just for reading. This one is for, uh, this is competing with the, 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 the iPad. And then the phone. And then you have a totally different context. You have the context now. I need this now. I need to know when the bus comes. Now. So, and always checking. So different things, and we're going to be talking about these things in the course. One of the things we're going to be looking at, so how can we predict this? How can we <clears throat> predict what's happening, what's going on? Or if something happens, so when you walk out the door of the last lecture, I want you to know, this is the goal that I have, when you open a newspaper, probably on a device like this, and you see a news item of something coming to the market, great invention, it's not going to be a surprise to you. It's going to be, yeah, I knew that was coming, and I know why. So that's the goal. Okay, um, so next I'm going to talk about the course, but let's take a break. Isn't there a break now? Okay, let's take a break and then...
we'll continue.